Uh, thanks, Vishnu, uh, for organizing this event and having me here. Um, and thank you, everyone who's here. I don't know what time zones everyone's in, but uh, there are no windows, so it's very hard for me to gauge. <laughs> but thanks for coming. <clears throat> um, so I'll be talking about uh, the diversity. You, you, you can all see my slides, right? I should just check that, right? I don't see nodding. OK, great. Okay. So <clears throat> if you look around at the world, uh, for example, here, you know, um, an example, pristine nature, there's such a diversity of life uh, and, and the shapes and forms of things that you see. And it's not just in nature that you see such diversity, but uh, in the, here we go, in the cultures uh, uh, and, the, and the peoples and the societies that we see around the world, but also within uh, the nature of matter and the objects that constitute the physical world around us. So what I'll be talking about today uh, is a bit of my work, but also within the context of a, a general philosophy of science from a physicist's point of view, very light on the philosophy of science, but uh, trying to draw the broad strokes. Of it. And so I thought I would start with a couple of quotations. So here's, here's the first one. Uh, it's by uh, Professor Bill Bialik, who is professor of physics at Princeton. He was one of my mentors. And this is what he writes in his textbook. Academic disciplines have a choice to define themselves either by their objects of study or by their style of inquiry. Physics at its best, I would like to think, is firmly in the second camp. This is make it their business to ask certain kinds of questions about nature and to seek certain kinds of answers. Thinking like a physicist means something and we are proud to do it. It is this above all else that we try to convey to our students. We are the intellectual heirs of Galileo taking seriously his evocative claim that the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. It's a very modest description of the lineage of physicists, but I think the point here, right, is that one way to do science is to really focus on a particular object and to really get to know its ins and outs. But another way is to use those objects to hone the way that you think. And that's a much more general way of doing science because it doesn't really matter what particular objects you're looking at, but those are sort of case studies for exploring and building your method of inquiry. So kind of of this flavor, uh, here's another quotation by uh, the Henri Poincaré, uh, the giant in mathematics and physics, uh, fundamental, um, uh, contributed to fundamental developments in the study of dynamical systems. And he writes, the aim of science is not things themselves, as the dogmatists and their simplicity imagine, but the relations among things. Outside these relations, there is no reality noble. So again, this notion that it's not the objects that matter, but the way that we understand how they're connected. So he says science, uh, but I think he's talking about a mathematics of uh, a mathematical conceptual framework for understanding how uh, this, the objects in nature are related to one another. So with these quotations in mind, uh, let me say a bit about what I do. So I study uh, the connections between individuals and collectives. So when you put individuals together and they interact, and they form a collective, what sorts of regularities do you get? And so let me give you a few examples of what I, what I mean by individuals and collectives. So in the, in the middle here, I hope you can see my mouse. Um, in the middle here, you have uh, these neurons and a brain, right? So the neurons are very relatively simple objects that are active or inactive and communicating with one another. And from this low level behavior, what you get are these complex structures like consciousness, um, uh, your memory, um, 
physiological regulators and so on. So here we have the individual components, which are these neurons, and we have this macroscopic object and thing that's very complex. And we'd love to understand how that arises from the activity of the neurons. Here's like a very different example on the right, which is uh, a more social example, where you have individuals on a court and they form groups, they form collectives, and that collective uh, makes decisions. Uh, on the bottom left uh, is an ecological example where you have trees uh, that compose a forest and that collective itself can actually be thought of as sort of a big tree itself. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on. And here's another example on the bottom uh, middle, which is of these monkeys that get in conflicts. And so each of these individuals is, is uh, you know, has a particular place in the society uh, and uh, interpretation of what, what role others play. And from their collective dynamics, uh, we find features that aren't just about the individuals, but about the way that they interact. And at the bottom right is something that I've worked on as well, which is the way that local places in Africa play a role in shaping the dynamics of uh, conflict spread uh, in different areas. And at the very top left, the one that I skipped is maybe the most esoteric one. This is an example of a magnet model from physics. And so what you have in each of these boxes is like a little magnet. And um, if you've ever played with toy magnets, you know that if you put them together, they tend to align with one another, right? So the north goes with north and south goes with south. And so if you have these interacting, uh, they will tend to align. So those are ferromagnetic interactions. But it, of course, you can have anti-ferromagnetic interactions. And so you have this maverick here. And the question here, or one of the questions that people are interested in is trying to understand how you get these blocks of behavior, of collective behavior, out of these microscopic interactions. And I, I'm giving you these examples because they're like concrete examples for trying to answer a much broader question, which is what physical laws govern collective behavior across biology and society, and where do they come from? And I thought I might just take a moment here uh, to ask if people in the audience were familiar with what physical laws were, or maybe had any in mind that they've heard of. You can raise your hand or, or, or type in the box. Maybe I'll just read it. Of course, I'm not sure if I can see the chat. So that's kind of, oh, here, here's the chat. So, so here's, you know, one is, uh, you know, entropy always increases. That would be like a physical law. Um, another one could be, you know, gravity, right? Or even if you're thinking more broadly outside of uh, physics, uh, evolution. So that's what I mean by physical laws, mathematical principles uh, that drive phenomena, that constrain phenomena, that explain a wide range of phenomena. And I'm interested in trying to answer questions like this uh, by using these uh, different case examples as places to really dive in and, and sort of hone the way that we ask the questions. So let me, let me give a couple examples um, of what I do. So here's, here's one example that I mentioned earlier, which was uh, the Supreme Court. So the US Supreme Court consists of nine people, nine justices that are appointed by the, or appointed by the, they're not appointed, they're nominated by the president and then confirmed by the Senate. And they get a case before them and they have to decide what happens. And if you read in the news, right, you hear that, oh, they're divided between liberals and, Dem or liberals and Republicans um, or liberals and conservatives. So there's already this notion that it's not really the individuals that matter, but there is some sort of collective dynamic. And in fact, the outcome is also collective because you have to have a majority to decide on what the, what the opinion is. 
And so one way of looking at what they do is to, to, uh, to see that when they have the majority opinion for a case, that you have justices that vote for the majority and then you have justices that dissent. And they might dissent for various different reasons, but at the end of the day, you have a pro and then a, and then a con. And if you look uh, at this, you know, at their voting data, what it really is is a bunch of yeses and noes then. Yes, we agree, or no, we disagree. And what that looks us like to us as, as physicists is this magnet model that I mentioned earlier, right? So you have these ups and downs, and because they interact, uh, sometimes they like to point in the same direction, and sometimes they like to point in opposite directions. Maybe that sounds like, you know, conservatives banding together and, 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 and uh, people on different sides uh, going against each other. And it turns out if you take that model seriously, you can write down the mathematics of it, you can solve it for the Supreme Court, and it captures their behavior quite well. So this is, gives us a way of thinking about the problem that's very just concrete in the case of a physics model. And it allows us to connect the behavior of the individuals to the collectives that we get. Right? So I mentioned one of these collectives as this five to four division. That's not the end of the story. There are many other things going on in the Supreme Court. Just the news tends to focus on that. So that's very nice. And what we can do is we can ask questions about uh, collective behavior. So one thing that we tried was we, we, we looked <clears throat> at the Supreme Court over time. And what you'll notice is that if you, if you have, if you watch the Supreme Court, right, there are only nine people ever on the court. So after a long period of time, people have changed and you have new people on the court who have never seen the old people. But there are some people who stand between, who overlap both. So essentially you have an interaction between the people who came in the past and the people who sat in between and the people who sat in between and the people who came in the future. And effectively that gives us, uh, you know, what you might call a magnetic interaction uh, between these uh, groups. And so you can then take that model and ask what sorts of behaviors this, this collection of people show over time. And it turns out that one of the things that you can find is that the time that the, the past or the future rather takes to forget the past is on the order of a hundred years. Interesting. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay, so um, if it takes around a hundred years for us to forget the past in for the Supreme Court, uh, does it take different amounts of time for other phenomena? And is there a correlation in the number of cycles in each phenomena to forget the past? For example, Supreme Court, you could say, is in an yearly cycle because they have you know an yearly type. Um, or, or four yearly cycle if you go with elections or yearly if you go with their uh, calendar. Mm -hmm. um, so so is, is the number of cycles the same across phenomena? No, no, it's definitely much longer on the Supreme Court actually because, because justices are appointed for life. So they tend to be there for um, a decade. Oh, right. I, think, I forget what the median was, but it's around 15 years or something. It's actually a pretty long time. Um, and Probably longer because they're all younger. So. Oh, well, yeah, now, now it might be quite different. Yeah, because now we have all these young people who will be there forever and determining our, our lives. Um, but that's a, another discussion. Uh, no, actually, so the, the data that we were looking at was not the latest data, but from, I think, 1954 to like 2016. Mm. And, in that, and during that period of time, it's about, I think, I think it is about 15 years, I can't remember. But the longest that anyone stayed on the court, uh, Forgetting his name now, but was uh, he was there about thirty six years, so a hundred years is still quite a long time, even relative to the longest person who sat there. And he's, he, you know, some people have, were on the court for one or two years um, because you know they they decide they want to run for president or something. Um, so it's actually not <laughs> not just explained by the fact uh, that some individuals were on the court for long periods of time, and so it has to be something that's collective. It has to be some kind of institutional signal. And, and your question is really fantastic because if you look at the cycle for uh, you know, the legislature, right? there is every, at least in the US, every six years you have people
coming up for election. I mean, you have an election every two years, but you know you rotate and who who comes up for election. Uh, so, so it seems to impose a faster cycle. We don't, we haven't looked at it, so we don't know. But then again, there are people who stay for a really long time, right? I mean, Reed and McConnell, all these old guys. So I, I'm not sure actually. Thank you. Um, okay, so so yeah, so you have this collective uh, time scale that emerges, which is which is quite interesting. So another thing one can do is uh, if, once you have a model like this, right? You can also ask how could I change collective outcomes if I were to change people's votes? So if you could go in and and tweak different things, what would be the thing that really changes, you know, the composition of the majority? And that's something we tried. And, and what one finds is that depending on what institutions you look at, you get very different structures. And this is very interesting because if you think about polarization, right, it sort of pins, if you have two evenly defined groups, it sort of pins power into a few people who are sitting in the middle who are persuadable. Uh, but if you have other kinds of systems, they're in a sense more robust at these kinds of you know, concentrated pressure. So anyway, the idea here is that you know, once you have a model like this, you can really start asking these questions concretely and mathematically. And I also want to just draw your eye really quick to this notion that we could we could look at this system as a set of binary votes. Because if you start thinking about other phenomena in nature, like inside your brain, your neurons, right, you're essentially on or off at different points in time. So if you take a snapshot, there's a vote that your neurons are making. And again, they tend to be correlated in some fashion with each other. So again, you have this notion that maybe you can map neurons to this magnet model, and you can use some of these ideas that, that maybe you have from looking at other systems and applying it to uh, a variety of other domains. And that's something that people have done. OK. So that's, that's case study number one. Here's, here's another uh, set of work that's in a, completely different. Um, and this story uh, is about energetics. And the idea here is that if you look at cells, right, they use some amount of energy for the amount of mass they have. So that's some metabolism for their mass. And blue whales do the same thing. They're much bigger. They're, like a, they're about a quadrillion times bigger because they're also made of cells. But it turns out that they don't use a quadrillion times much more energy. They use a lot less. In other words, their cells are much more efficient. And it turns out that the way that they're efficient just depends on the mass of the animal. So if I looked at an elephant versus a human versus a mouse, all the way down to a cell, that the bigger I get, the more efficient they are. And the way that they get more efficient is it follows what is known as a scaling uh, law which has an exponent of three fourths, if you're familiar with power laws. And what that is, is, is something that's some sub, uh, sublinear, right? You get more efficient as you get bigger. And what's remarkable is that this seems to be true across all of life. So why is that the case? So one of the theories that, that explains this is the notion that what's important is the way that energy is distributed through the body. Okay, in order to get energy from one, you know, where you eat all the way to the rest of your body, or the reverse case in trees, from the environment into your body, you have to have some kind of architecture that fills the space that you occupy. So this is really clear when you look at a tree, right? You're basically looking at its insides. <laughs> You're looking at its veins and capillaries. And that's how it's collecting energy from the environment. And we do the reverse because our bodies have, you know, we consume things and then our blood trickles out to every single cell. Mm. And that structure uh, leads to uh, a sort of efficiency gain. <laughs> okay. And that's, that actually turns out to explain why this, uh, why you get this trade off as you get to bigger and bigger animals. So it's just about energetics. And what's actually quite interesting, oh, actually, sorry, before I forget, so if you, this is the diagram of a tree that you see here, and then um, actually it's a picture of a tree. 
But you could also think about the vasculature of a society, right? So when you have many individuals, do they sort of form some kind of weird giant organism? And this is showing you a transportation truck flow into a port into Texas. And you can see again, this kind of vasculature. You might've thought it was a river. So again, it's sort of similar. Uh, and we were inspired by these pictures to also think about how armed conflict spreads in a branching way across space. But what's in the background is this forest that I mentioned at the beginning, where you can see that uh, we can imagine that if you were to look at a forest, you have these big trees that have gaps, and between those big gaps, there are smaller trees, but those smaller trees have gaps, and then between those, there's yet smaller trees and so on. And that sort of self-similar structure is sort of like this fractal network that you see for trees. And so in a sense, forests are just giant trees. It turns out that's not true for every single forest. And this is a figure from a, for a paper where we showed that the interaction between the individuals leads to changes in the collective dynamics. So the spatial patterns that you get, so for fairy circles where they're quite regularly spaced versus forests, reflect something about the individual interactions. Okay, so the two stories that I was presenting here uh, go along two different ways, I think, physicists like to think. So one is a story of simplified models, right? How can we sort of remove the chaff and get at the real essence of the problem? And once we get the real essence of the problem, we discover that actually many things that we thought were different are actually quite similar mathematically. And it allows us to connect the dots, so to speak. And the second way of thinking about these problems and connecting them was through a sort of physical law principle about energetics and metabolism. And I think these uh, constitute just uh, several things that, that I would characterize physics thinking to be. And uh, there's this notion that we can connect different systems by thinking about the underlying principles, uh, what they look like, but also how they appear. And in order to do this, we need to really extremely simplify the systems. If we cared about every single detail or every location of every atom and every organism, we would not be able to start thinking about principles. We have to erase some of the details in order to get there. And one of the, the benefits of doing something like this is that you get the solvable mathematics. So you can print down a rigorous theory uh, that you can compute, that you can, you can do experiments on. And that's actually one of the dirty secrets of physics, right? Is that some of the things that we think we really understand are uh, these highly simplified representations of what happens in nature. But it turns out that that's key. All, actually, all of these are key for getting to what we call a physics intuition. And a physics intuition is something where we aren't so worried. It's, it's sort of a heuristic, right? We're not, we're not so worried about all the details, but really trying to build a heuristic that works, that's grounded in reality and mathematics and helps us understand how the world works around us. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I, guess, I guess this is when we can have a discussion. <laughs>